Natural Order Podcast, Episode 7. Welcome to the Natural Order Podcast with your hosts, Ryan O'Leary and Adam Heyman. Welcome to the Natural Order Podcast. I am Adam Heyman. And with me is my co-host, Brian O'Leary. Hello, Adam. How you doing, sir? Good to hear your voice and uh, I believe a nice, new, rich, silky microphone. Hey, don't jinx me. <laughs> I did buy a new microphone. We we pay attention to customer feedback here yeah. at Natural Order Podcast and uh, heard some complaints about my audio quality. Yeah, so well, I'm doing what I can. It's a work in progress. Step one, new mic. What do we got today? Well, I want to follow up on a conversation you and I had off air. You said you want a divorce, and I'm concerned. What, mm. What's on your mind, Brian? A natural, we call it a natural divorce, a national divorce. <laughs> yeah, well, I was I was queuing you up for a, yeah. a, a bad marriage joke, but <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, we're talking about national divorce here. It's in the zeitgeist. We even have Congress critters talking about it, and... I know it's a subject you've been thinking about, and I wanted to know what is motive, just for you personally, mm -hmm. not the nation, yeah. but Brian O'Leary, why, why do you think that this, this great nation ought to call it quits? Well, it's a nuanced answer. I don't necessarily think the United States needs to disappear or should disappear. However, it's broken, and it's a... It's a broken political system. It's corrupt. It's all the above. It's it's not a, it's not a good place. But you know, on the other hand, it might be, unfortunately, the best place in the world to live, which I think <laughs> very is also very true and not mutually exclusive. However, I think that the idea, the topic of a natural divorce, is interesting to me, where people can split aside from the other people within the United States. Uh, I don't know how wise it is at this yeah. stage. There's issues, right? Uh, yeah. I, I just think that if we do it the old traditional way, where you have, well, 51% of the people in one area vote to, say, secede, in lack of better terms, secede from the other, you know, from the rest of the states and 49% want to stay loyal or vice versa, you're going to have a real problem uh, with people well, before after we, the uh, fact getting, getting along. But that's, I guess, the- Before we get to the, yeah. the mechanics of how such a thing would happen, and hopefully it wouldn't involve us getting our, our legs blown off by cannonball, right? because that's not pleasant. I saw it in a movie. Um, you mentioned that you thought our political system was- Broken and corrupt are those two the, and we understand what the corruption is. That's that's not new. What what do you think's broken about it? Uh, well, I think that the one person one vote idea is inherently uh, it doesn't work because not everybody votes, and I don't even know if that would even work. I mean, it's an idea. It's a political idea, the whole uh, democracy one. I like the idea of a republic more than I do of this direct democracy that the United States has kind of devolved into, I'd say. But Hamilton, getting back, we talked, I think, Hamilton a few episodes ago. He, I believe, liked the the corruptive nature of a government to some degree because it, the political shenanigans, I think it actually functionally may work better with all this grift and corruption, but it's not good for the average person to get just bilked out of their uh, money and their uh, everything else. Well, that's for sure. That's just, that's In just essence, not fair. There's a problem with democracy itself. You just hit upon it. It's not yeah. fair. Why in the world should a society of three of us exist in a situation where two of you can vote to rob me and enslave me, you know, because you're, you're two thirds of the public and I'm only one third. Yeah. Famously, we don't have a democracy vote who pays the check at the dinner party. <laughs> if, exactly. If, if seven people are there, four people say, okay, Adam, you're stuck with it. Well, uh, okay. Well, majority wins. No, 
that's that ain't Since right. Since you brought up that example, yeah. uh, I want to quickly mention a book that our listeners really ought to read by Michael Humer, uh-huh. a philosophy professor out of Boulder, Colorado, called "The Problem of Political Authority," and he uses the intuitionist approach to tackle the problem of political authority. Anyway, great book. A couple more questions just to try and flush out your thoughts on the subject, sure. and then we can get into some of the nuts and bolts. I remember after Trump won, you'd hear some blue regions of the country, California specifically, yeah. talking <laughs> talking like uh, like the South in, in, yep. in 1850. Um, they're talking about, you know, he's not my president, and what the hell is California even part of this wretched union who – it was attached at the hip to all these deplorables who voted for that racist idiot. You know, why Why should we belong in the same polity with these people? We have nothing in common with them. Well, I have some sympathy for that argument. And I'm like, hey, you're, you're making some sense. So, so my question, Brian, is are you wanting a divorce because, like, those people were singing a different tune when Biden won? Now it's all national unity, right? Right. So I'm wondering, since the right appears to be on the decline a little bit, is that is that what's motivating you or is, or is it something deeper? In that situation, I would I don't know if I, I I live in California now. I when that when that whole thing you was happening. Poor bastard. Yeah, no kidding. When that whole thing was happening, you know, like blue California or whatever it might be. It's not that I was against I'm like, I'll, I'm all for you splitting away. But again, at that point, I want to split away from you. I want to split right. away from you because what you are going to do to me is worse than what that other sector of, you know, government that you're trying to run away is going to do to you. But so you're going to then, you know, it's the tyranny of the majority type thing with the democracy where you're left having a dissident voice and you're going to get punished. Right. Even if you don't have a voice, well, the- even if you have like a, just a dis, uh, a dissident way of thinking about things, you're going to get punished with that. Well, one of the beautiful things about the idea of secession, the concept, is that once you grok it, once you get it in your head, that there's some historical justification and some just moral and ethical justification for one polity to mm-hmm. break away from another, like the Scots wanted to do in England right. or against England and the way Britain itself from the EU and the Catalonians in Spain wanted mm-hmm. a break off. Once you get that idea that it's just, it just keeps expanding. Yeah, why should people in rural Illinois be dictated to by all those commies in Chicago? Right. You know, they don't they don't want to live the same kind of life. They have different values. Why should one dominate the other? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and I I've I've said in this whole argument that I think we need to look at it in a totally different manner. It what happened in the 1860s. Well, first of all, I say that it wouldn't be I don't think it'd be particularly wise for a quote unquote national divorce right now for many reasons. But you go back to the Civil War. I don't I believe in the right of secession. I mean, it's inherent. And I just don't know if it was wise for the South, even though yeah. I'm ultimately sympathetic to the South in most cases. Well, they did have that one glaring problem. They have. Well, <laughs> so did so did the North. Yeah, I know. I this know. whole thing about when you go, uh, the victors write the history. And, you know, my family is uh, well, ha- half of it's largely Southern. So anyway, uh, that's not the not the point. The point being is that it was easy back then to say, all right, we're on this side or we're on that side, because there was a line of states where it was specific, where you know where you're going to go for right. the most part. I mean, the cotton states. And then you had the bo- the states on the border that had to choose. And so a lot of the sympathies they had, they would have, like a lot of these states had two governments, uh, right. you, you know, Kentucky, for instance, they had, uh, the fact that the split now is not contiguous is definitely, it makes things tricky. Makes for things sure. tricky. So I don't, I think that the whole idea of territory going along with this thing, uh, is, is such a, is an ancient concept, but we're still, st- I agree. we're still stuck with it for whatever reason, because we see maps and maps right. mean a lot still in this day. And I just don't think in this argument, we I think we need to put maps aside for now. And I don't care 
I want to be different than my neighbor who's a commie. I want to be yep. totally apart from it, but I don't necessarily have the ability to just pick up and move to where I want. I want to, like, why can't he move? You know, I, I want my own space because I like it here. Neighbor, move. Then they, they're not going to move. Well, we're going to separate. We're going to put up a fence or whatever. And the thing is, like, you get power. That side gets power, and it's usually their side, not my side ever. But then they just use it as a, like a cudgel, like you've said before, a cudgel and just beat you with it. Yeah, they do. That's not the kind of life I want to live. But I also don't need to be pressured into say, oh, it's that's what it is. So just move. No, you move. I'm I'm planting my feet right here. Amen, brother. Well, as I think I've said on this podcast before, I think the future of humanity, if we're going to survive, is going to be to evolve past monarchies and past all these nation states, all these tribal groupish collections where yeah. some ruling elite claims a geographical monopoly on the use of force and then just lords it over everybody. Mm -hmm. I think it's a massive mistake. And I think that we broke away from the concept of federalism largely in the United States. And mm -hmm. that's a big part of the problem why we're at each other's throats. It makes a difference whether Trump or Hillary Clinton wins because whoever wins, mm -hmm. the loser on that battle, the citizenry, has every reason to expect that they're going to get brutalized by the victors because ultimate power or close to it, is seated in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. We've abandoned federalism, mm -hmm. where the national government doesn't have the power to boss around everybody in the states. There's a bulwark there, and maybe states can be tyrannical too, but there's a lot of freedom to be found in the fact that there are competing centers of power. Mm -hmm. And we were stupid and greedy and selfish to desire to seize power in Washington so that we can use it against our fellow man. We should have respected the wisdom of the founders in making a federal republic where where it was the states that were Yeah, I yes. Yes, but no, because these people Well anyway, I wanted to lead you with a question. I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> Do you think that there's a chance I think we're gonna break up. I uh -huh. think there are going to be secession movements, not just one, not just red blue. There'll be multiple. But do you think that we could avert that if we returned to federalism in our view of what America is. Boy, I guess, y yes, I do believe that could be avoided, returning to federalism. There's zero political will to return to federalism on either side, really. I mean, we're kind of out we're outliers here. And I don't even think it's the best system. You go back to, you were talking about nation states and stuff. Ah, I'm ambivalent on the whole idea of a nation state, too, but... I want a better if if we're gonna have nation states, I want a better one. <laughs> I, want, I want a good one. I don't want the one that we have now or the one they have, you know, the the ones that are pockmarked across the European Union. I don't want those. If we're gonna have a nation state, I want the best possible nation state. The problem is, I I don't know that that's the ideal, and so I think we're it's it's a hard way to figure ourselves out of this because, I, well. I think you get back to your question more specifically, the federalism, if we have a better approach toward federalism, like the founders had in mind, certainly a lot of the problems that we're currently facing would go away. But you mentioned the states, the local states, they can do whatever they want. They will. There'll be a tighter focus of power in those states and these evil governors that exist. I mean, we have Gavin Newsom in California. The guy is a cretin and a creep. Yeah, he is. Tina I, Kotak I get your point. in Oregon. I mean, these are people who have nothing positive going for them. They're evil human beings. I get your point, but uh, I don't think you're looking at it quite right. Okay. Um, a lot of people say that one of the reasons the Enlightenment occurred in Europe is because of all these tiny little centers of political power, these city-states. Mm. And then back then you had the secular power versus the religious power. And point being that you could just vote with your feet and get yourself in a completely separate political order right. by picking up your chickens and marching 200 yards you know, down sure. the road. And there's, there, again, there's freedom in these smaller jurisdictions. The local tax eater has to compete for its tax base or they're going to leave. 
And you'll, you'd get a lot of that in a U.S. that was committed to federalism and there was no Berlin Wall to keep Californians such as yourself from fleeing the tyranny of mm -hmm. Gavin Newsom. Yeah. Well, I guess it goes back to the point. I mean, do we want to be associated with one people, one tribe, one nation? I don't I kind of... No, I don't. Okay. I, I, I've always liked and enjoyed being known as an American or an Oregonian or something, but I don't want to be associated with Joe Biden or I don't want to be associated with Tina Kotek. I believe in America, you have certain heroes, a certain culture, you have your holidays that are all American. I believe that's a positive thing to have I think a, you're, a culture. I think you're right. But why in the world would culture and cultural identity and the concept of being American need to be tied to some political structure? Those things don't have to be contiguous oh, either. No, right. Yeah, it doesn't. And yeah, I mean, you could draw a map where, um, yeah, I mean, none of it has to be contiguous. I could have like a little circle around where I live and I'm part of this other thing and I'm surrounded by, but I, I mean, I guess that, that becomes very complicated. That <laughs> becomes something that we're ne it's never going to happen. Oh, sure it is. Uh, Sure it is. Don't be so pessimistic. I, I think that a breakup is possible. I think a total chaotic mess is possible. I think a change in, in government or change in governments, depending on what side people end up on, but doing it in a peaceful manner where I can just take my lot of land and declare it associated with these people or not, declare it independent. No, people, that, that's never going to happen with in human nature. Because I think that happening is essential to human nature. I think I think political decentralization is an idea that's going to catch on like wildfire. Maybe not in my lifetime. I no, don't know. not in our lifetime. And I think maybe that maybe we reframe the argument. Maybe I'm overstepping or overstating my belief. It's certainly not going to happen. And the God willing, I have, you know, four or five decades left on this earth. Uh, it's not going to happen then. Maybe in 200 or 2000 years. I mean, Human beings have made remarkable progress uh, in short periods of time, relatively. And it could happen. I don't have a whole lot of faith in human beings as a species as I did before 2020. That's for sure. I, I learned a lot of things. Even with all their failings, they want to be free. And in 1988... I think that a lot of people want to be free. They can't be free. No, in They're 1988, no one in the world free. thought that the Soviet Union was going to just collapse. Right. And it did. Yeah. Um, I just read Michael Malice's The White Pill, uh -huh. which discusses this issue in great detail. And yeah, it shocked everybody. Sure. And it was, you know, mostly peaceful. And what came after was pretty crappy until you compare it to the hell that was, you know, right. the Warsaw Pact. Well, the idea of freedom also is relative. I mean, certainly they're more yes. free now. I don't wouldn't say they're, that anybody on earth is really a free people per se. Well, I'll give you this. The mm -hmm. the urge to dominate, to mm -hmm. tell your neighbor what to do or else is embedded in our nature as humans. But so is the essential desire to not be tyrannized by your neighbor. Yeah, the, that's, a par that's a paradox in big, itself, isn't it? Not really. No? When we've got these great big cerebral cortexes. Can't we figure out that, oh, yeah, in order for me to be free, I have to resist the temptation to want to dominate my neighbor. Mm -hmm. We have to make that power a thing that nobody wants, because if you try and exert it, the very next time political winds change, oh, my God, now I'm oppressed by that structure. Mm. So I think that the urge for political decentralization, the desire to minimize polities, ideally down to the level of the individual, and resort instead to bizarre, strange concepts like property rights and free association. Right. I think people naturally want that, and I think... We're going to snap out of this nation state malaise and figure that out. Yeah, I, I just don't know what the catalyst is. Is the catalyst listening to Adam Heyman and Brian yep. O'Leary? Uh, I, <laughs> yep. I mean, I think it's, honestly, it, it, it might be. Oh, that's one of the goals of this show to get people to think a little differently. I mean, I, I think of things a bit differently than you, but I, I don't think we're too far off in this. I have a feeling that I don't know if it's innate in people to want to change political structures. I think that, that that's too hard, but I 
think that if people were exposed to the ideas, they'd at least be curious and willing to entertain them. I think I changing think so these permanent structures, these permanent things is really too hard for a lot of people and a lot of groups of people just because of the... Well, it's hard. I yeah, mean, it's you've a, got a, yeah, it's a lack of better. Your it's inertia hard, is a inertia. certain way. You're, yeah. you're used to a certain set of things and changing it is, you know, <laughs> it's a big, huge hassle and you just might get murdered. But, I mean, I never had entertained such thoughts that you were even talking about, what am I, old now, 30, 30 years ago. Like, I wouldn't have ever heard, like, it's absurd. Like, it's the United, right. United States is good. Soviet Union is bad. East Germany the is bad. <laughs> West Germany is good. I mean, that was it. That's true. And that's not wrong, but it's a, it's just like New, Newtonian mechanics, right? It's right. It explains a lot, but it's not complete. Mm -hmm. And I think that good versus bad nation state paradigm, uh, that, that paradigm is cracking. Mm -hmm. And I think people are starting to understand that there is a better way. It involves, at the very least, more decentralization in political authority, more federalism where you can't achieve total separation. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, ideally, we don't have a monopoly government system at all. We have contracts and, and associations that are... Yeah, it'd be nice. I mean, all this stuff would be entered nice. Entered into freely. Yeah, I mean, of course you know, it'd be nice. It'd be better. I have no idea yeah. how that's going to come about in the well, short, in the short term. Right now, we're all taught, those of us who have higher education, that we belong to a social contract that we didn't sign, as, right. as envisioned by, who knows, Rawls or, or Rousseau. And all that has to happen for us to get there is for people to realize that contracts, those aren't these intangible things. You actually sign those. Right. You make an agreement. You actually enter into it. If social contracts are so important, then why don't we actually treat them like they're important, like real contracts? Yeah, you make entering into 16, them something 18, that you 21, actually... 16, 18, 21, 25 years old, and you put your thumbprint down, or you sign you sign your name, or you you give something up to, you know, to say like, oh, yeah, this is what I'm willing to trade, and it, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, well, I'm not pessimistic. Like I said, I probably won't live to see it, but I think national divorce or secession or something uh -huh. like it is on the... On the horizon, and uh, I want to direct people to our show notes page for this episode because we're going to put some great reading resources. Um, that Michael Humer book that I mentioned, yeah. The Pro Problem of Political Authority, we'll link to that. We'll link to Michael Malice's The White Pill. And Bob Murphy wrote a excellent little mm -hmm. pamphlet, I guess you'd yeah, call it. Yeah, I think he calls it a pamphlet. Right, called uh, Common Sense, A Case for Texas Secession, which is very intricate. And also, Tom Woods has an ebook on the subject. And Ryan McMakin of the Mises Institute just came out with a great new book called Breaking Away mm -hmm. The Case for Secession, Radical Decentralization, and Smaller Polities. And not only does he go over the ar arguments that we've discussed here just briefly, mm -hmm. but he talks about real world examples where things like this have happened right. on large scales and small, where political boundaries that you wouldn't think are changeable. Uh, well, over the grand space of time, they're imminently changeable. Right. So let me, I guess, leave you at this. I think that you'd agree with me that this has to happen at a local or a small, the smaller level, the better, right? I talked about my neighborhood. Well, it's better if I have neighbors that all get along, right? It's weird in this culture today where people buy on price and they don't buy on location. It's not like that's a whole nother problem that we can get into that d didn't really happen for until the last like 20 or 30 years. But if, if it happens where folks can get together and resist and or band together one or the other in a smaller localized polity, and then that can build out. So the smaller is the better, right? The smaller right. is I mean, the better. You're... And then that builds, this small thing builds into, and then merges with, or kind of coalesces with this other small thing and this small thing becomes bigger. And then, then we'll have to do the whole exercise over again when we, when yeah, we get our way. Yeah, you're describing because, the met yeah. metastasization of, a can of cancer. <laughs> but you touched on something that's really critical at a very base level. There's something that makes a little bit of sense about people banding together locally and trying to solve problems communally. Mm -hmm. That's sort of how, you know, the myth of government 
arises. Sure. No government ever actually arose that way, but at least it's a structure that makes sense. We we here in this tiny little group will come to some collective agreements and we'll we'll do things communally. Mm-hmm. Well, how perverse is it when you then try and take that structure where you had like a, a village elder sort of leading the group of 30 and you're morphing that into a structure where there's 330 million people involved in the power center, the village elder, he lives over in Washington, D.C. somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, the whole thing is uh, is perverted. And those <laughs> those small polities uh, globbing together to become big ones. Yeah, man, that's cancer. Mm-hmm. That's a mistake. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it. It could be a good, a better cancer than the one we have. Like, does that the, yes. the better cancer kill right. the bad cancer? I don't know. I mean, that we then you, you reach for these metaphors and stuff, but I don't know. I just I'd like a more peaceful society with people that are at least mildly educated on a lot of things. I just don't think we have it. I think there's a there's a force in place. I'm not calling it a conspiracy, but there's a force in place to dumb down. The population, and I think things like independent media that we participate in have a huge place in this culture for getting out the word. This show itself, I've talked about this, people, my show, your show, this show, that's not going to change worlds. But what is going to change worlds is more and more of this stuff. Because if you don't like the way we talk about it, well, we can actually probably direct you to people that do talk about similar things and you can get on their train. I don't care. As long as the ideas keep progressing and keep developing and the idea of human freedom, it's just like so preposterous for so many people, but it needs to happen for the society to ultimately flourish. And I'm of the, I'm, I'm whatever you call one of the pills. (laughs) I don't see, I don't see it happen in my lifetime. I'm a short term pessimist, long term optimist, I guess. Right. Is ultimately where where I come down on on all that. So ultimately, I guess I am white pilled. If that's the, the from long. the grave. Yeah, from the grave you right. are. Yeah, we have to wrap up, but really quickly, you touched on you know the kind of people you want to live around, um, and the rules that you want you know mm-hmm. in, for your neighbor and yourself to have to interact through. Well, those things should be entered into voluntarily by choice, so that people who want to live the same way. Mm-hmm. group together and that's that's called a covenant community in mm-hmm. this lexicon and it's it's beautiful if you don't like these rules you don't have to go live there and if if you do well they can find people who want to live just like you do and no one's the use of force isn't there that's that's hans herman hoppe right um yeah i i, I don't know if he originated it but mm-hmm. yeah he talks about that a lot because yeah. he's a brilliant man yeah yeah and i read uh democracy the god that failed few months back excellent book which we'll also link to on the show notes it's worth getting and and it's a kind of an expensive book if you haven't if it's out there but it's worth getting one way or another getting your hands on that well you should have bought it in the early 2000s like i I should it's cheap i should (laughs) yeah but uh yeah it's definitely worth getting your hands on and um like all this stuff but our show notes will have links to what we call it our book club right now and we just have links to everything we've it's just a resource page lack of better terms right for sure yeah we'll have all that stuff there at naturalorderpodcast.com and uh thank you brian for uh tell us telling us your thoughts about national divorce and thank you dear listener for tagging along with us yeah we'll see and uh, we start reading a lot of these books and uh, everybody can have their own nuanced opinion on all this stuff. And it, uh, as long as we're heading in the right direction, I think we can afford all these nuanced opinions. And I think we're going to be better off. Cause like, certainly Adam, you and I don't a hundred percent agree on this or the, the tactics and, but we're moving toward the right direction. And I think you said that in an earlier podcast, as long as we're all kind of moving in the same right direction, we're, we're, yeah, be- sure. we're better off. I think it. you and I, generally have real similar value structures and worldviews. We're sort of disagreeing on what gets us there. Yeah. Strategies, largely the same. Tactics might be slightly different. Mm, Yeah. I don't know what those words mean, but yeah, something (laughs) like that. (laughs) Anyway, very nice talking to you as always, buddy. All right. We'll chat again next time. Bye. For more, head on over to Natural Order Podcast. Dot com.
for the show notes page for this episode, it's episode seven, go to naturalorderpodcast.com slash ep7. That's EP7. And stay tuned for a word from one of our sponsors. Thank you. Can't imagine anybody going to Scarborough Fair. Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. However, where you should go, head on over to O'LearyAndCompany.com, where our purpose is to guide the entrepreneur on his or her journey. I've navigated the minefields of self-employment for better part of two decades now, and I've done that, ultimately, so that you don't have to. I like to say I've never really failed, but I sure have had a lot of opportunities for personal growth. So at Illyrian Company here, my goal is to help entrepreneurs so that their growing pains don't hurt as bad as mine once did. OllyrianCompany.com.